Gilbert K. Chesterton once said, in everybody there is a thing that loves children, fears death, and likes sunlight. And this thing enjoys Charles Dickens. Before I tell you about the Christmas Carol, let me read to you what Charles Dickens himself wrote about this story. I have endeavored in this ghostly little story to raise the ghost of an idea which shall not put my readers out of humor with themselves, with each other, with the season, or with me. May it haunt their houses pleasantly. Charles Dickens. To begin with, Jacob Marley was dead. There is no doubt about that. You will therefore permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was as dead as a doornail. Did Scrooge know that he was dead? Of course he did. Ebenezer Scrooge and he had been partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge never painted out Marley's name. And so there it stood seven years afterwards above the warehouse door. Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted old sinner, hard and sharp as flint. The cold within him froze his features because he always carried his own low temperature with him. And he didn't thaw one degree, not even at Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. Christmas. Humbug. Christmas, a humbug? Uncle, you don't mean that, I'm sure. What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. What right have you to be dismal? You're rich enough. Humbug. What's Christmas to you but a time for finding yourself a year older but not an hour richer? <laughs> Every idiot that goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled in his own pudding. Now, Uncle, I know you... Now, you keep Christmas in your own way, Fred, and I keep it in mine. Be off now. This is a place of business. Well, don't be angry. Come dine with us tomorrow. No. Caroline will be happy to see you. Why did you ever get married? Because I fell in love. Love? <laughs> That's the only thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. Good afternoon, nephew. Uncle, I'm sorry with all my heart to find you like this. Uh, Merry Christmas, Bob. Merry Christmas, sir. Let me hear another sound from you. You'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. <laughs> Convenience, huh? It's not convenient. But it's only one day in the year, sir. A poor excuse to pick the pocket of your employer every 25th of December. But be here all the earlier next morning. I will, sir. And a Merry Christmas to you, Mr. Scrooge. Ah. Christmas. Nonsense! Humbug! And while most of London was jovial and full of glee in honor of this Christmas Eve, Scrooge had taken his melancholy dinner at his usual melancholy tavern. And having read all the newspapers, he went home to bed. Scrooge lived in the chambers which had once belonged to Marley, his ex-partner, and as I have remarked before, Marley is dead these last seven years. Dead as a doornail.
Give Benita Scrooge. How now? What do you want of me? Much. Who are you? I I was your partner, Jacob Marley. You don't believe in me? I I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your own senses? I don't know. Then why doubt your senses? Because a slight disorder in my stomach could make my senses cheat me. You might be an undigested bit of beef, a broth of mustard, a fragment of underdone potato. Humbug, I tell you, humbug! <laughs> Mercy on me, dreadful apparition! Now, do you believe in me or not? I do, I do. But why do you come to plague me? And why do you wear that ponderous chain? I made it, link by link in my life, as you are doing for yourself on earth. <sighs> it is now a part of my penance, and I am here tonight to warn you of a fate such as mine. But Ebenezer, if you change your ways, you have a chance of escaping my doom. You were always a good friend to me, Jacob. Thank you. Thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow, when the bell tolls one. Expect the next, on the following night, at the same hour. And the third on the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Couldn't I take them all at once, Jacob, and have it over with? Look to see me no more, and look to for your own sake. You remember what has passed between us. <laughs> Scrooge tried desperately to say humbug to the strange happening, but the word stuck in his throat, unuttered. For it was highly probable it was not humbug. Being very much in need of repose from the experience he had undergone, or shall I say, fatigues of the day, he went straight to bed without undressing and fell asleep in an instant. A few hours later, of Christmas past. Long past? No. Your past. What business brings you here? Your welfare. I have things to show you which are the shadow of the things that have been. Right. Most of Christmas past led Scrooge down the road which he had forgotten for so many years. He showed him a Christmas day in the past, which was a happy one for most children, but not for one lonely schoolboy. Ebenezer Scrooge, do you know that boy?
Yes, yes, I do. It is I as a boy. Oh, I remember that Christmas well. I felt so lonely. My playmates, they didn't like me. It was because you had shunned them? I wish... What is the matter? There was a boy singing a Christmas carol on the street last night. I should have liked to have given him something, that's all. Shall I show you another Christmas, 40 years ago, when a fair young girl released you from your marriage contract? No, no! Because she discovered you had ceased to love her. Your greed, avarice, and desire for wealth had killed the love she had for you. No, no, spirits, show me no more. Leave me, haunt me no longer. Awakening in the middle of a prodigiously tough snore and sitting up in bed to get his thoughts together, Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was again upon the stroke of one. Christmas presents. Look upon me. Yes, spirit. Conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. This is the house of your clerk, Bob Cratchit. But he has hardly a penny to his name. I, the ghost of Christmas present, have blessed his house. Here comes Bob now with another member of his family, Tiny Tim. And a Merry Christmas, everybody. And there you are, Tiny Tim. Right in your own chair. Merry Christmas, Bob. And Martha. <laughs> yes, here I am again. Christmas wouldn't be Christmas without Martha coming to visit us. And how did Tiny Tim behave today, Bob? Fine. He told me coming home that he was glad he'd been to church, because it's pleasant to remember that the day is called Christmas, after he who made the lame to walk and the blind to see. Oh! Oh, beautiful Christmas table. It would be more beautiful if we had a turkey, but we'll manage. Of course we will. See what a happy family your clerk has on only 15 shillings a week? Tiny Tim. I didn't know he was sick and a cripple. Mr. Scrooge. I give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon. <laughs> Dear, it's Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, when one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. My dear, it's Christmas. Very well. I'll drink his health for your sake, and because it's Christmas. Long life to him. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. A, a Merry Christmas, Christmas and a Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. God bless us, everyone. Tell me, Tiny Tim, will he live? I see a vacant seat and a little crutch without an owner. No, no. Say he will be spared. 
My life on a globe is very brief. It ends tonight. Tonight? The time is drawing near for me to go and for your third visitor to appear. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any specter I have seen. But lead on, I want to know. young man today who asked after you. Mr. Scrooge's nephew, whom I scarcely know. I told him about Tiny Tim, and he said, I'm heartily sorry for you and your good wife. By the by, how he ever knew that, I don't know. You what, dear? That you were a good wife. Oh, everyone knows that. And he said, if I can be of any service to you at any time, pray come to me. He's rather unlike his old Uncle Scrooge, isn't he? You must torment me. Be quick. Take me to what else you have to show. I don't know much about it either. I only know he's dead. When did he die? Last night, I believe. What had he done with his money? I haven't heard. But he'll have no use for it where he's going. <laughs> it's likely to be a cheap funeral. For upon my life, I don't know anyone to go to it. Suppose we make up a party and uh, volunteer. When I come to think of it, I'm not at all sure that I wasn't his most particular friend. For we used to stop and speak whenever we met. I don't mind going to his funeral if lunch is provided. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what man they are speaking of. Who is it that lies dead? the man I was. Assure me, I yet may change the shadows you have shown me. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. Tell me I may sponge away the writing on this stone. Marley! Marley! Jacob Marley! Heaven and Christmas time be praised for this. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirit of all three shall thrive within me. <laughs> boy, oh boy! Yes, sir? What's today? What, sir? What's today, my fine toe? Today? My Christmas day, sir. It's still Christmas? And I haven't missed it. <laughs> for a man who had been out of practice for years, Scrooge gave a most illustrious laugh, the father of a long line of brilliant laughs. <laughs> <laughs> and Scrooge dressed himself all in his best, and at last got out into the streets, wishing everyone he met a Merry Christmas. Mr. Fred! Come in, come come in. in. Have you room at your table for some friends? Oh, you're very welcome, Mr. Fred, sir. And you too, ma'am. I only hope that our lowly feast is to your liking. Now, don't fret about provisions. We've brought plenty for all. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Bob! Mr. Scrooge! And Mrs. Cratchit, for you. Mr. Yes. Scrooge! My dear, that's for you. Darling, for you. For me? And you, sir. Oh, Mr. Scrooge, I don't know how we can ever thank you. Don't! 
and I'm going to raise your salary and help your large family in every way possible. And Tiny Tim, <laughs> I saw a friend of mine at church just a little while ago, a famous surgeon. You and I are going to see him tomorrow, and he's going to be your friend, too. Mr. Scrooge! Oh, Scrooge won his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. Scrooge had no further dealings with ghosts, but it was always said that he knew how to keep Christmas well, if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May it truly be said of us, and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. The first Noel, the angel did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay. In fields as they lay, keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so interrupt your work, but you're making a serious mistake. Huh? With reindeer, I mean. You're putting Prancer where Dasher should be. And Blitzen should always be on my right-hand side. He should, huh? I, yes, and another thing. Dahmer's antlers have four points instead of three. But I don't suppose anyone would notice that except me. No, I don't suppose so. <laughs> Say, who are you? My name is Kringle. Chris Kringle. Well, <laughs> glad I could be of help. Bye. See, it's all in your wrist, like throwing a ball. Now watch. See? Mrs. Walker, that new Santa Claus you hired is wonderful. Where'd you find him? We answered the ad along with a hundred others. He is good, isn't he? Well, the parade's ready to start. You coming? <laughs> I'm going home and get in the hot tub. I may just stay there until next Thanksgiving. But you've worked so hard on the parade. If I want to, I can see it from the roof of my apartment. Bye. <laughs> Look at that.
that big baseball player? He was a clown last year. They just painted him different. My mother told me she manages the parade. Wow. He's really a giant, isn't he? Really, Mr. Gailey. And you a lawyer. There are no such things as giants. Well, maybe not now, Susan, but in olden times, like the giant Jack killed in the fairy tale. Oh, one of those. I don't know any fairy tales. You mean your mother or father never read you any? My mother thinks they're silly, and I never met my father. You see, my mother and father were divorced when I was a baby. Well, that baseball player sure looks like a giant to me. Come in. Hello. My housekeeper told me Susan was here. I'm her mother. Yes, Susie's told me quite a bit about you. Oh, she's told me quite a bit about you, too. The man in the front apartment. Hi, dear. Great, much better than last year. Mm -hmm. Good. I hope Mr. Macy agrees with you. Would you like a cup of coffee? Oh, don't bother. Don't no bother. It's ready. <laughs> I want to thank you for being so kind to Susan. All part of the plot. Surest way to meet the mother is to be nice to the child. <laughs> what a horrible trick. Susan tells me you don't approve of fairy tales. I don't. I think we should be realistic and completely truthful with our children. Not let them grow up believing in a lot of myths and legends. Like Santa Claus, for example. I see. The parade's over, Mother. The acrobats were good. Those prices, they should be. Mother, I was thinking, we've got such a big turkey for dinner, and there are only two of us. Couldn't we invite Mr. Gailey? Couldn't we? Oh, dear. I... Oh, please don't bother. I'll just uh, get a sandwich or something. It's an awful big turkey. Oh, it's not that, dear, but I'm sure Mr. Gailey has other plans. No, he hasn't. Have you? Well, as a matter of fact, to be truthful and completely realistic with the child, I must say I haven't. Please, Mother, please. Didn't I ask her all right, Mr. Gailey? Well, that all depends. Dinner's at 3 o'clock. Susan, you asked just right. <laughs> <laughs> Before those screaming brats arrive, I want to give you a few pointers on how to be a good Santa Claus. Go ahead. Now, here's a list of toys we have to push. You know, things we've overstocked. You'll find that a great many children are undecided as to what they want for Christmas. When this occurs, you immediately suggest one of these items. You understand? I certainly do. Uh, all right, here they come. You get up there and go to work and memorize that list. And remember, be jolly. You're working for Macy's. I did that. Making a child take something he doesn't want just because he bought too many of the wrong toys. That's what I've been fighting against for years. And what's that, Pop? Praying to commercialize Christmas. And a Merry Christmas to you. <laughs> now then, what's your name, little boy? Peter. And what do you want for Christmas, Peter? I want, um, I want a fire engine just like the big ones, only smaller. It's got real hoses and squirts real hot water. I won't do it in the house only in the backyard, I promise. Mm -hmm. Now, Peter, I see you're a very good boy. So you'll get your fire engine. You see, I told you to get me one. Mm -hmm. Yes, dear. Well, look, you wait right over there. Mommy wants to thank Santa, too. <laughs> by saying a thing like that. I've been all over town trying to find that kind of a fire engine. Macy doesn't have one. Nobody's got one. But you can get those fire engines at the Acme Toy Company on West 46th Street. Only $4.50. Wonderful bargain. Oh, I follow the toy market pretty closely. Macy's sending other people to other stores? Well, the important thing is to keep the children happy. Whether Macy's or somebody else sell the toy, that doesn't matter, does it? Don't you feel that way? Me? Sure, but I didn't think Macy's did. I don't get it. I just don't get it. Oh, yes, we have skates. Nice, shiny skates, and they're very good, very good indeed. But I don't think they're the kind of skates you want. Now they have really wonderful skates at Gimbal's. Gimbal's? He said I was to speak to you. Uh, are you the head of the toy department? Yes, ma'am, yes. Well, look, I want to congratulate you on Macy's and this new stunt you're doing, sending people to other stores. To think that a big store like this puts the spirit of Christmas before the commercial. I haven't done much shopping here before, but from now on, I'm a regular Macy customer. Kimball's. When you come to see me at Macy's, 
I shall tell you all about the wonderful toys. This seems awful silly, Mr. Gailey. Well, maybe you'll feel differently after you've talked to Santa Claus. Goodbye, and Merry Christmas. Now, ah, what's your name, little girl? Susan Walker, what's your name? Well, Chris Kringle. I'm Santa Claus. <laughs> you don't believe that, do you? You see, my mother is Mrs. Walker, the lady who hired you. But I must say, you're the best-looking one I've ever seen. Thank you. Your whiskers don't have those things that go over your ears. That's because they're real, just like I'm really Santa Claus. Go on, pull them. Go on, go ahead, pull. That's it! <laughs> and what do you want me to bring you for Christmas? Nothing, thank you. Whatever I want, my mother will get me. Sensible and doesn't cost too much. Susan, dear, I think you've taken up enough of this gentleman's time. Your maid had to go home. Her mother sprained her ankle. She asked me to uh, bring Susan down here for you. Yes, she phoned. I thought as long as we were here, we might as well uh, talk to Santa Claus. He's a nice old man, Mother. And his whiskers are real, too. Yes, dear. A lot of old men have real whiskers like that. Susan, if you'd like to go over and look at the dolls, I'll be with you in just a minute. I want to All talk right. to Mr. Gailey. I didn't think there was any harm in saying hello to the old gent. I'm sorry. Well, I think there is harm. I tell her Santa Claus is a myth, and you bring her down here to meet a very convincing old gentleman with real whiskers. What's wrong with that? By filling her full of fairy tales, she'll grow up to believe life is a fantasy instead of a reality. She'll keep waiting for Prince Charming to come along, and when he does, he'll be a... We were talking about Susie, not you. Whether you agree with me or not, I'll have to ask you to respect my wishes. You sent for me? Oh, yes, sit down, won't you? This is a lovely little girl you have here. Thank you. Uh, Susan's the reason I asked you to drop down. Uh, she's a little confused. Would you tell her that you're not really Santa Claus, that there's actually no such person? I'm sorry to disagree with you, Mrs. Walker, but not only is there such a person, but here I am to prove it. <laughs> oh, no, you, you don't understand. I want you to tell her the truth. Uh, what is your name? Chris Kringle. I'll bet you're in the first grade. Second. No, no, I mean your real name. It is my real name. Second grade. Good gracious. It's a progressive school. Oh, progressive school. Well, where did you get such a lovely outfit? Macy's, we get 10% off. Um, Susan, would you go in and talk to Mrs. Adams for a minute? All right. Goodbye, young lady. Hope I see you again soon. I hope so, too. Bye. Chris Kringle. Address, Brooks Memorial Home for the Aged. If you care to call them and ask for Dr. Pierce, he'll be happy to confirm it. Age is... Old as my tongue, and a little bit older than my teeth. Now, really? Well, that's the truth. Next of kin, Donna, Blitzen, Prancer. And Dancer. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Mr... Kringo. Uh, Yes, well, uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to make a change. You see, the uh, Santa Claus we had last year is back in town, and, well, I feel I owe it to him to... Uh... Have I done something wrong? No, no. Excuse me. Yes? Mr. Macy wants to see you immediately, Mrs. Walker. Oh, yes, right away. Uh, you'll have to excuse me. Uh, Miss Adams will give you a voucher on the way out, and you'll receive a full week's salary. About that new sales policy that you two seem to have initiated. It would have been better to clear it with the sales department first, don't you think? Mr. Macy, I... I... Macy's Santa Claus sending customers to Gimbel's. Preposterous. What? Yet, we cannot quarrel with success. Telephone calls, telegrams, over 500 parents expressing their undying gratitude to Macy's. So as a result, I've decided to make this the new sales policy for the entire store. If we haven't got what a customer wants, we'll send him where he can get it. In this way, Macy's will be known as the store with a heart. 
the store that puts public service ahead of profits. And consequently, of course, we'll make more profits. Well, I just want to express our appreciation and to tell you that in your Christmas envelopes, there'll be a more practical expression of our gratitude. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank That'll you. be all. Thank you. Oh, oh, and tell that wonderful Santa Claus of yours that I haven't forgotten him either. No, no, never mind. I'll tell him myself in the morning. <sighs> Imagine, a bonus. I fired him. Who? Santa Claus. No, no. He's crazy, he thinks he is Santa Claus. Well, I don't care if he thinks he's the Easter Bunny. You better get him back. Oh, it's too great a risk. He might have a fit or something. I tell you, the man's insane. Maybe just a little bit insane. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sawyer. What? We'll get Sawyer to examine him. He's a psychologist. That's what he's being paid for, to examine the employees. Can't get him back. He's already gone. Well, then you better scoot after him and get him, because if you don't, we're going to have a very unmerry Christmas. Oh, Mr. Kringle. Mr. Kringle. Uh, I'm afraid I acted rather hastily and perhaps unfairly. Uh, this other Santa Claus, well, Mr. Macy has found something else for him to do, and, well, we want you to stay on. Well, this is mighty good news. You see, Mrs. Walter, for 50 years or so, I've been more and more worried about Christmas. Christmas is not just a day, it's a frame of mind, and that's what they've been changing. Well, I'm glad you're taking me back. Maybe I can do something about it. And I'm glad I met you and your daughter. You're my test case. Oh, we are? Yes, in a way, you're the whole thing in miniature. And if I win you over, well, there's still hope. If not, I guess I'm too. But I'll try, and I'm warning you, I don't give up easily. Oh, but well, Mr. Kringle, uh, first thing in the morning, would you report to Mr. Sawyer's office for a little examination? Mental examination? Well, uh, partly, yes. Oh, I don't mind. I've taken dozens. Haven't failed one yet. Yeah. How many days in the week? Seven. How many things do you see? Four. Muscular coordination? Perfect. Who was vice president under James Monroe? Daniel D. Tompkins. I'll bet you Mr. Sawyer doesn't know that one. <laughs> How much is three times five? You asked me that before. I'm conducting this examination. How much is three times five? Same as it was before. Fifteen. You're rather nervous, aren't you, Mr. Sawyer? Do you get enough sleep? My personal habits are of no concern to you. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just that I hate to see anyone all tied up. How many fingers do you see? Three. You bite your nails, too. I want you to stand up straight with your arms extended. <clears throat> Muscular coordination test. Surely I'll be glad to. You know, very often nervous habits like yours is caused by insecurity. Are you happy at home, Mr. Sawyer? That will be all, Mr. Kringle. The examination's over. You may go. And it may interest you to know that I've been a happily married man for 26 years. Oh, I'm delighted to hear it. Bye. Your wife, Mr. Sawyer. What else? Agnes, how many times have I told you not to bother with the office? No, I give you a perfectly liberal allowance. If that fat, stupid brother of yours began a job, you wouldn't have to be pestering me all the time. Not a penny. How long have you known him, Dr. Pierce? Well, he wandered into the home about eight months ago. Looked the place over and said, uh, well, it'll do. Just stayed on. Has he ever told you his real name? He said he was Chris Kringle. We never pressed him further. Mrs. Walker, after giving that man a comprehensive examination, it's my considered opinion that you should be dismissed immediately. Uh, Dr. Pierce, Mr. Sawyer. Uh, how, excuse me, didn't Chris answer the questions correctly? Well, yes, he did, but there was a complete lack of concentration. There's no doubt about it, he should be placed in a mental institution. Oh, wait a minute, people are institutionalized to prevent them from hurting themselves or other people. His is a delusion for good. He only wants to be friendly, helpful. Mrs. Walker, naturally, I cannot discharge this man. So when he begins to exhibit his latent maniacal tendencies, which I assure you he will, the responsibility will be entirely yours. Oh, Dr. Pierce, if there's the slightest possibility of trouble, I... Now, what trouble could Chris possibly get into? No. Well, the, coming to work, for instance, a, a policeman might ask him his name. Now, you know that would get him into a fight. Well, that could be avoided easily enough. Find someone here in the store to rent him a room. Then they could go to and from work together. 
Oh, yes, that would solve everything. That's a wonderful idea. Yes, isn't it? Uh, your son's away at school. What about his room? Well, I'll talk to Mrs. Shellhammer as soon as I get home. In the meantime, you take Chris home to dinner. Oh, no, I couldn't. Oh, really, Mrs. Walker? If I can supply the room, the least you can do is furnish a free meal. <laughs> What sort of games do you play, Susan? I don't play much with the children. They play silly games. They do? Like today, they were playing zoo, and all of the children were animals. Homer was supposed to be the zookeeper. He said, what kind of an animal are you? I said, I'm not an animal. I'm a girl. He said, only animals are allowed here. Bye. Oh, that's too bad. Sounds like a wonderful game to me. Of course, to play it right, you've got to have imagination. Do you know what imagination is? That's when you see something and it's really not there. Well, yes. But I believe imagination is a place by itself. Yeah, you know, like, well, you know, the British nation and the French nation. Well, this is imagination. <laughs> Say, how would you like to make snowballs in the summertime? Or drive a bus uh, down Fifth Avenue? Hmm? Uh, or be the Statue of Liberty in the morning? And in the afternoon, a flock of geese flying south? Well, the first place, You'd have to learn to pretend. That's imagination. Now, the next time they play zoo, you tell Homer you're a monkey. But I don't know how to be a monkey. I'll show you. And stand up. First, you bend way over. That's it. Keep your arms loose. Now, then you scratch. <laughs> <laughs> On the contrary, the firm of Hazlip, Sherman and Hazlip has been very good to me. But being an exceptional lawyer, I want to open my own office. Naturally. <laughs> we're having our first lesson in pretending, and we're doing pretty well, too. <laughs> she'll be having nightmares for weeks. But she'll be having a lot of fun in the daytime. Hello? Oh, Mr. Shellhammer, that's fine. The Shellhammers have a room for you. That's very kind of them, but I've accepted Mr. Gailey's offer to stay with him. Mr. Gailey. I'll get the meat. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mr. Showhammer, but it, it seems he's made other arrangements. Uh, uh, yes, well, uh, goodbye. Well, here we are. Mmm, steak. No, it's venison. A friend of mine at the office gave it to me. That's venison. Oh, uh, dear meat, if you don't like it, I have eggs for you. Uh, could I have eggs, too? Venison, you know, I couldn't. Oh, I forgot. Well, there must be something you want for Christmas. Something that even your mother doesn't know about. Why don't you give me a chance? All right. Good. That's what I want for Christmas. Uh -huh. A doll's house like this? No, a real house. A real house? If you're really Santa Claus, you can get it for me. And if you can't, just a nice man with a white beard like Mother says. Well, just because every child doesn't get his wish, that doesn't mean there isn't a Santa Claus. That's what I thought you'd say. But what could you possibly want with a house like this? Live in it with my mother. But you have this lovely apartment. But I want a backyard and a swing and... She can't get it, huh? I didn't say that. Well, that's a tall order. But I'll do the best I can. May I keep this? Mm -hmm. Good night, Susan. Good night. Do you like living in the city? Oh, it's all right. I kind of like to get out in the country sometime, though. Not a big place, just one of those junior partner deals in Manhattan. I know the kind you mean. One of those colonial houses. Uh, or Cape Cod. I've been thinking about Mrs. Walker. You know, like a lot of divorced women, she's determined that no one will ever hurt her again. With a little more effort on your part, she might be made to crawl out of a shell. You know, those two are a couple of lost souls. It's up to us to help them. I'll take care of Susie if you'll take care of her mother. It's a deal. Good. You ready? Oh, no, you don't. I'm not going to be cheated that way. All my life I've wondered, and now I'm going to find out. I'm going to learn the answer to the question that's troubled the world for centuries. 
Does Santa Claus sleep with his whiskers inside or out? Always sleep with them out. Cold air makes them grow. I never expected to see. Two can play at this game, Mr. Macy. If Gimbel's hadn't got what the customer wants, we'll send him over to Macy's. It'll be a pleasure, Mr. Gimbel. <laughs> there they sat, adult but children still, children at heart. It was summer, warm, glorious summer. The end. Do you like that story, Susan? Mr. Kringle, do you think I'm going to get my house for Christmas? Well, I can't promise, but we mustn't give up hope. Good night, Susan. Tomorrow evening, I'll read you another story. I can't. I've got to go to school. Isn't this vacation? Yes, but this is what they call a required function. Required function? The Fillmore Progressive School requests your presence at a special performance of a Christmas play to be given in the modern manner. What does that mean? A Christmas play without Santa Claus. Well, a Christmas play without a Santa Claus? The performance will be followed by a short address. Subject, exploding the myth of Santa Claus. <laughs> the guest speaker will be Mr. Albert Sawyer. I'm very happy you enjoyed our little play. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our old friend, Mr. Albert Sawyer. Parents and young people, it's thrilling indeed to see so many happy, smiling faces. I know you're all looking forward to a joyous Christmas, but as those of you in this intelligent group know, this is going to be a Christmas without Santa Claus. Such a person as Santa Claus, St. Nicholas, or Chris Kringle does not exist. Never has existed and never will exist. This silly old man in his red suit represents the wishful dreaming of all people. He's the all-giver, the generous father. Mature adults who keep this myth alive are clinging to childish fantasies and show themselves afraid to face realities. People who play Santa have a strong feeling of guilt. <laughs> I see nothing to laugh at. Far from being amusing, this myth... Far from being amusing... Far from being amusing, this myth is actually harmful. Only stupid old men, prancing around in white whiskers, keep this ridiculous myth alive. Now he's gone too far. He became violent because I attacked his delusions, and he'll do it again. Well, if you ask me, I think we ought to get an outside psychiatrist to examine him. Then you'd better do it right away before Mr. Macy hears about it. Oh, that's right. Uh, you explain it to Mr. Kringle. After all, you're his friend. Oh, no, I can't. I... Well, I've grown very fond of him, and this is going to hurt him deeply. I, well, I just can't. All right, what can we do? I think I have it. You tell Kringle Mrs. Walker wants him to leave at once in order to have some publicity pictures taken with the mayor. I'll have a car waiting outside, and once we get him in the car, we'll drive him straight off to Bellevue Hospital. Yes, that'll do it. I'll ride up front with the driver. <laughs> Fred, you flunked that psychiatrist examination deliberately, didn't you? Why? I had great hopes, Fred. 
I had a feeling that Mrs. Walker was beginning to believe in me. Now I know she was only humoring me all the time. Mrs. Walker didn't know anything about taking pictures with the mayor. That was Mr. Sawyer's idea. It isn't just Mrs. Walker. Take Sawyer. Contemptible, deceitful, dishonest. But he's out there, and I'm here. If that's normal, I don't want it. But you can't just think of yourself. What happens to you matters to a lot of people. People like me who believe in you and what you stand for. People like, well, like Susie, who are just beginning to. Chris, you can't let them down. You're right. Let's get out of here. Now, wait a minute. You flunked that examination, but good. Yes. I said our first president was Calvin Coolidge. Oh, but you can fix that. You'll think of something. Now, take it easy. A judge is going to be asked to sign papers committing you to a mental institution. The only chance would be to prove you legally sane at a public hearing. Good. I can think of nothing better. Don't you see? That will settle the question once and for all. <laughs> I swear the evidence you are about to give at this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, good morning. You may proceed, Mr. District Attorney. My name's Thomas Mara. What's yours? Chris Crinkle. Oh. Where do you live? That's what this hearing will decide. It's a very sound answer, Mr. Crinkle. Thank you, Your Honor. Tell me, do you really believe that you're Santa Claus? Of course. <laughs> the state rests, Your Honor. In view of this statement, do you still wish to put in a defense, young man? I do, Your Honor. I'm fully aware of my client's opinions. In fact, that is the entire case against him. But Mr. Kringle is not sane because he believes himself to be Santa Claus. An entirely logical assumption, I'm afraid. Not necessarily, Your Honor. You believe yourself to be Judge Harper, yet no one questions your sanity, because you are Judge Harper. Mr. Kringle is the subject of this hearing, not me. Exactly. So I intend to prove that Mr. Kringle is Santa Claus. <laughs> What does Mr. Hayslip, Hayslip, Sherman, and Hayslip say about the trial? That I was jeopardizing the dignity of the firm, that I either dropped the case or they dropped me. So, leaving me no choice, I quit. Oh, Fred, you didn't. Well, I can't let Chris down. He needs me and all the rest of us need him. Oh, darling, he's a kind, wonderful old man, but... Well, you can't throw away your career because of sentiment. I'm not throwing a career away. I'll get by. I'm a darn good lawyer. This doesn't shake your faith in me, does it? <laughs> this is a question of common sense, not faith. Faith is believing in things when common sense tells you not to. I wish you could let yourself believe in people like Chris, and in fun, and love, and joy, and all the other intangibles. Can't pay the rent with intangibles. And you can't live without them. Why don't you try a little blind faith, darling? String along with you. I think I've got a right to ask that. I think I've the right to ask you to be a little bit more practical and, and realistic. Yeah, I suppose you have. It's all cockeyed. Here we are, as close as two people can possibly be, and yet there's a loneliness about it. I've tried my best. I know you have, darling, and so have I. But we're gonna need a lot more than each other's arms. And somehow, I just don't think we've got it. Funny. With all my common sense, I, I was just beginning to think this time it might work out. So was I, but... Can I help you trim the tree? Thanks, I can do it. Well, good night. Good night.
you your name, sir? R.H. Macy. Do you recognize this man? Yes, he's an employee of mine, Chris Kringle. Do you believe him to be of sound mind? I certainly do. Mr. Macy, you're under oath. Do you really believe that this man is Santa Claus? Do you? I do. <clears throat> that is all. You are fired. Your Honor, there is no such person as Santa Claus, and everybody knows it. I ask that the court make an immediate ruling. Is there or is there not a Santa Claus? I, uh, oh. uh, this court will take a short recess to consider the matter. I don't care about the law, I'm talking about politics. You go back in there and rule that there's no Sandy Claus, we won't be even able to put you in the primaries. Oh, Charlie, Charlie. I, I'm a responsible judge. How can I seriously rule that there is a Santa Claus? All right, go back in there and rule there isn't. The kids read about it, so they don't hang up their stockings. So what happens to all the toys that are supposed to be in them stockings? Nobody buys them. Oh, the toy manufacturers are gonna love that. What about the Christmas card makers, the candy companies? Oh, boy, are you gonna be a popular guy. And what about the Salvation Army? They got a Santa Claus on every corner. Henry, I'm telling you, if you go back in there and rule that there's no Santa Claus, you can count on getting just two votes, your own and that district attorney's out there. One. District Attorney's Republican. The court will rise. <clears throat> uh, this court has just uh, consulted the highest authority available. The uh, traditions of American justice demand uh, a broad and unprejudiced uh, view of uh, such a uh, controversial matter. And therefore, this uh, court is uh, determined to keep an open mind and um, hear the evidence from either side. But can my opponent produce any evidence in support of this contention? Your Honor, I can. Will Thomas Mara take the stand? Who, me? Thomas Mara, Jr. Thomas Mark. Hi, Daddy. Tommy, you know the difference between telling the truth and telling a lie, don't you? Everybody knows you shouldn't tell a lie, especially in court. Do you believe in Santa Claus? Sure I do. And what does he look like? There he is, sitting over there. I object, Your Honor. Overruled. Tommy, why are you so sure there's a Santa Claus? Because Daddy told me so, didn't you, Daddy? <laughs> and you believe your Daddy, don't you? Sure I do. Daddy wouldn't tell me anything that wasn't so, would you, Daddy? <laughs> Thank you, Tommy. <laughs> Bye, Daddy. The state of New York is willing to concede the existence of a Santa Claus. But I ask that Mr. Gailey produce authoritative evidence that Mr. Kringle is the one and only Santa Claus. Uh, your, your point is well taken, Mr. Mara. Mr. Uh, Gailey, are, um, are, are you ready to show that, um, that Mr. Kringle is Santa Claus? O on the basis of uh, competent authority? Not at this time, Your Honor. I ask for an adjournment until this time tomorrow. Now, this court stands adjourned until 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. That's all ready. What are you doing? 
writing to Mr. Kringle to tell him I believe in everything he told me. Everything will turn out fine. Oh, that's nice. He'll like that. Where shall I send it? Uh, why don't you send it to the county courthouse? Okay. What did you write, Mother? I believe in you, too. Doris. Go take your bath now. Could you give me the number of the main post office, please? Hello, dead letter office. Are you kidding? We got maybe a couple of hundred thousand. Yes, ma'am, we sure would. Hey, lady, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> Thank you. Chris, I, I've got bad news for you. I've tried every way to get some competent authority. I wired the mayor, the governor, everybody. Susan, and means more to me than all the mayors and governors in the world. It's all over. He hasn't got a thing. Your Honor, the defense has yet to produce one bit of authoritative proof that this man is really Santa Claus. And in view of the fact that it is Christmas Eve and we're all anxious to get to our homes, I ask that these commitment papers be signed without further delay. Uh, well, Mr. Gailey, have, have you anything further to offer? I should like to submit the following evidence, Your Honor. It concerns an official agency of the United States government. The Post Office Department, one of the world's largest business concerns, did a gross business last year of $1,112,877,174. Your Honor, I'm sure they're all deeply gratified to know that the Post Office Department is doing nicely, but it hardly has any bearing on this case. Furthermore, the U.S. postal laws make it a criminal offense to willfully misdirect mail or intentionally deliver it to the wrong party. Yeah, Your Honor, I'm sure that the state of New York is willing to admit that the Post Office Department is authoritative, prosperous, and efficient. For the record. For the record. Anything to get on with this case. Then, Your Honor, I offer these letters in evidence. They are simply addressed to Santa Claus, yet they were each delivered to Mr. Kringle by bona fide employees of the Post Office Department. I offer these as authoritative proof. Your Honor, three letters are hardly authoritative proof. I have further exhibits, Your Honor, but I hesitate to reduce them. Oh, I'm sure we'd all be glad to see them. Oh, yes, indeed. Um, put them on my desk. On your desk? Yes, yes. Very well, Your Honor. Every one of these letters is addressed to Santa Claus, and the post office has delivered them to my client. Therefore, the United States government recognizes this man, Chris Kringle, as Santa Claus. If the United States of America believes this man is Santa Claus, then this court will not dispute it. Case dismissed. <laughs> What's the matter with Susan? I think she misses Chris. Don't worry, young lady. Chris is bound to come. Didn't get my present, Uncle Fred. Why, darling, you got a lot of presents. Not the one I wanted. Not the one Mr. Kringle was going to get for me. What was that? It doesn't matter. I, I didn't get it. I, I knew it wouldn't be here, but I, but I get a letter or something about it. Hello? Hello.
Hello, Susan. Merry Christmas. Well, it wasn't really a promise. I said I'd do my best. You couldn't get it because you're not Santa Claus, that's why. You're just a nice man with white whiskers like my mother says. I shouldn't have believed you. Susan! Oh, oh, Merry Christmas, Chris. I'm sorry Susan is disappointed in me. Oh, oh she'll be all right. H here's Fred. Merry Christmas. Where are you? Out of the home. Fred, we're giving a little party this afternoon. Will you bring Mrs. Walker and Susan out to help us celebrate? Of course I will. Oh, you turn off the parkway at Seymour. Drive three blocks, then turn on to Ashley Drive. You'll see it on the right. Got it. Bye. Susan, I was wrong when I told you not to believe in Mr. Kringle. You must have faith in him. But he didn't get me the... It doesn't make sense, Mother. Oh. Faith is believing in things, even when common sense tells you not to. I mean, even though things don't work out the way you want them to the first time, you, you still gotta believe in people. I'll try. One of the tenants. Maybe. Maybe I didn't do such a remarkable thing after all. <laughs> 